Okay, good evening. I will call to order the November 18th, 2019 Haywood County Board of Commissioners meeting, a regular meeting, and the first order of business will be our Pledge of Allegiance, and after that, our uh, Reverend Womack is out of town, but I'll ask for a moment of silence. So if everyone please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic Okay, our next order of business will be a public comment session, and I would ask that you keep your comments uh, limited to three minutes. And when you come forward, if you would, just uh, say, uh, state your name and your address and maybe what group that you represent. I do have one person that has signed up tonight. It's Jean Paris from Drugs in Our Midst. Huh? I can get all the minutes Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, every now and then some people think they can, so. <laughs> uh. Thank y'all for allowing me a few minutes to speak, and I am glad to be here with you. And uh, I am from Canton, and uh, I am here to talk about the coat drive in Canton. It's a big deal. It has the whole town of Canton, the, all the churches in Canton and around Canton involved, and we should have lots of coats. And as you know from the uh, Mountaineer, there's a lot of movement uh, this year to take care of different issues for children and families and people in need. Uh, I've had several calls once since they've seen the uh, uh, thing about the uh, coats. They're asking me if I know if somebody has uh, wood. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, uh, Richard Reeves, of course. But I did find out there's a couple more places in Haywood that does supply wood. But what I came to tell you, you have a flyer that we passed out and that's about the coat drive. I would like to see you particularly, we have three people up there that uh, are from Canton. And so you guys, I wanna see you at the coat drive on Saturday, come in and have coffee with the needy. Those are the people that often vote the most and because they have the most issues. And also uh, you need to uh, let them know that they're important to you just like the rest of Haywood County. So come in, have coffee with them. We're gonna have coffee, Russian tea, donuts provided by the town of Canton. And uh, I hope that you'll be there to <coughs> greet them at some time during the day. It's gonna be from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. So you might could get a few minutes somewhere in there. And I'd appreciate it if you'd be there. Thank you. Jean, where, where was that? I, I missed that. Where is it? It's going to be at Canton First Baptist Church. Okay, First Baptist. Yes, because we have the big, uh, Looks like big okay. room. Thank you. Yeah, Gene hands the fly a flyer, Tommy. Yeah. Okay. Is there any, uh, that's all I have signed up. Is anyone else? Would anyone else like to address the board at this time? Okay. Seeing no one, I'll close the public comment session. We'll move to constituent concerns, and I wanted to. Uh, uh, you know, with Thanksgiving coming up, and uh, I wanted to say that our employees will be getting their Christmas bonus checks next uh, Thursday, uh, next Wednesday, which is uh, Thanksgiving Eve, and we'll be they'll be getting their bonus checks at that time. And we appreciate all the hard work and service that they've given to the county this year, and we hope that that'll help uh, with their some of their shopping for uh, Black Friday. Also, uh, I also wanted to mention with Thanksgiving coming up how thankful I am for my family and uh, especially my parents and uh, and I wanted and we just had veterans day and my father was uh, in the military and I had taken him to last week to the veterans hospital and I just want to give them a big thumbs up um, dad uh, went for his usual checkup and when you go there 
he had to go to five different departments and every department we went to, the, the, uh, the employees and the workers were so nice and we were truly blessed to have a, a veterans hospital in our area and they come from all over Western North Carolina. But I just wanted to give them a, a big thumbs up and my dad was so thankful for the care that he got there and he's always bragging on those folks over in Asheville so at the VA hospital. So I just, I just want to give a big thumbs up to the VA and I want to thank all our veterans for their service and their sacrifice because, because of them we can sit here today and do what we do. We can be elected and we can ha conduct ourselves in a, in a democratic manner. And, uh, and I appreciate the veterans and their sacrifice. So does anyone else have constituent concerns? And I'll start down here with Tommy. I did. I had a call from a constituent who drives a dump truck for a living. <clears throat> and he was concerned about the increase in pedestrian foot traffic on our roads in Haywood County, uh, mainly around Thickety Road, Incinerator Road, and uh, Ingalls and Canton. And <clears throat> he asked me if I knew anything to do to maybe raise public awareness. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, you know, the National Highway Safety Transportation Board has a guideline out on the website for uh, guidelines for pedestrians and for drivers. And, uh, you know, sometimes we take for granted that everybody's been trained at home or in school on the proper way to walk on the highway. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm finding people when I go to work in the morning at 6 a.m. with dark clothes on walking with their back to traffic. And I personally have had a couple close calls. I mean, you know, right when I got beside them, I'd seen them. So, if you can just communicate that among your family and friends and, and raise public awareness to uh, pedestrian foot traffic and also bicycles. There's, still, there's a lot of people using bicycles as a mode of transportation now. So, you know, be aware of that and, uh, you know, also for exercise. So just be aware of the pedestrians on, on the highway uh, this time of year especially. It's getting dark earlier and they're, out, they're still out traveling. And another thing, uh, I had a constituent call and wanted to update on the property that we have. Said we need to do a little better job of communicating to the public uh, of this economic development project we have on Jay Creek. So I gave our county manager a little heads up and, and just if he could just give us a brief synopsis on where we stand on that project and how much of it's completed, so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, the uh, the pay app, we, we paid for approximately 55% of the project. We're well ahead of that as far as work. Uh, I don't have a specific percent that's almost finished, but we, we have had the engineers out uh, last week uh, looking at some flat spots. We still have some elevation to gain, but the project really moved along nicely. Uh, it was the, the drought helped for this project. They were able to get in there and, and, and do it much quicker than we, we uh, had planned. Uh, December 2nd is our next board meeting. At that time, I can prepare a, a, a better, more thorough update. Okay, thank you. I, Bryant and I made one uh, site visit. I've been down there a couple of times myself, and as Bryant said, the dry weather we had, this beautiful fall weather, it, it really helped us with that project. And uh, we, we went down and toured the property one morning, and, and the contractor did an expedient job, and uh, looked like everything's going really well. That's all I had, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, fall's a good time of year to do grading projects. It's usually dry, so go ahead, Brand. Just uh, same thing as usual. I had a couple, and I've got with Mr. Moorhead and addressed those concerns. I don't have any. I've got a couple of people that were talking. You know, we've spent money out of the budget for our medical expenses right after the first of the year, and you know we did the budget, presented everything, and then a few other things came through that hit us for a pretty substantial amount. In December, the last meeting, you think you could just give us some kind of a kind of where we are so that people will see that, you know, we are spending out some money, but we're, for the most part, we're on budget. But it would be nice to know kind of where we are going into the new year uh, so people can kind of put their minds to ease. <coughs> uh, the other thing is the lady on the harm, I didn't get a chance to talk to you before, the lady at the harm coalition that does the counseling, were you able to get her set up to come back? I've reached out with Patrick Johnson and, and uh, Jesse Lee, and they are going to present on December 2nd, uh, talking about our uh, combating the opioid problem and, and, and what we've been doing and the successes we've had. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's been a very successful pro uh, grant that we got. I, th I think at the uh, December 16th meeting, 
uh, the, the auditors will present the audit and, and we'll yep. make sure that we highlight our health care expenditures at that time too. So there will be a lot of financial data at that 16th meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, right, thank you. okay our, next, our next order of business is administrative agency reports and presentation. And every year the commissioners attend the community clubs meetings and we thought it would be good if the community clubs came here and told the community what all they do to where it can be broadcast into the county. And we have several of them here today. And uh, as each community club gives its report, I'd like for whoever, that, that person for maybe for your, to, when you get finished with your report for the ones from the community that are here, maybe to stand for that community club. So I'm gonna turn it over to Brian and let him. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to add a little bit, I was invited to go to the uh, uh, annual awards banquet uh, in Asheville a couple of weeks ago, and I sat with uh, the Fines Creek table, and it was just really impressive. Uh, not just Haywood County clubs, but all across Western North Carolina. The uh, the, the three highest awards that, that the group uh, gives, all three came from Haywood County, and I thought it'd be great not just have them, but all of our clubs to give an overview kind of as they did in Crusoe a few weeks ago. So that's all, all I can add. You want me to go? Okay. So we'll just go through the alphabetical order like you did that night we were there. <laughs> so if Bethel Community Club would come up and give and tell us what y'all have done last year. I mean, I'm sorry, Be Beaverdam, Beaverdam, I'm sorry. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <coughs> that was my fault, sorry. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Linda Worley and I live in Beaverdam in the Canton area. Uh, I will say this, we do have a small club at Beaverdam, but we have a very active club. As you know, we build our own building. Uh, the biggest project we had this year was probably our playground that we built for the community and we've seen lots of children playing on it. Uh, a couple of the members, one of them being me, we kind of went out and tried to drum up money and we collected $5,000 from people in the community and businesses and paid for our playground without using any of our money from the club. We've given four scholarships. We had a house in the neighborhood that burned, so we give those people money. We give $1,200 a year to the community kitchen and also we supplied $400 worth of bathroom supplies for their new facility that people are gonna be able to take showers in. We gave out 21 food boxes to the needy families. We sent money down east when the flood came. We have a monthly manna distribution. We also gave money to the Hadra for the Dementia Alzheimer's Association. We purchased a new stove and we installed security cameras and lights and I think that's kind of been a help with a couple of instances on Beaverdam, our security <laughs> cameras. Uh, we hold monthly meetings for the community every month and we try to give out as much information on different projects and different programs as we can. Uh, we've had a program on the pathways. We had a program that Jean did with Drugs in Our Mist. Zeb Smathers came and spoke to us one month about all the new activities in Canton. The sheriff came. We've had Danny Barrett with the 10 Acre Garden. Comet, one of the facilities that is on Beaver Dam, he came and discussed the manufacturing and we were really surprised at how many people are employed in that place. We knew there's a lot of traffic, but. <laughs> Uh, the North Carolina, uh, North Canton Fire Department gave a home safety program for us. We hosted a holiday dinner that we were proud Brandon came to eat with us uh, recently for all the community. As you know, Kent, uh, Beaver Dam is one of the polling precincts and also the old Smoky Mountain Tractor Club meets monthly there. We have a young lady that started up a new business. It's, uh, she does baking for that Canton Paper Town coffee shop. So she, she uses our building to start up her business and do her baking. Uh, we actually won $1,000 from the WNC Communities Program. And we have approximately 102 rentals. And that is to people in the community. They have 
birthday parties, family reunions, we've had weddings, all kinds of things, any service that we can provide. And of course, we took in over $7,000 in rental income. So we, we try to come up with as many things as we can to, to serve the community. And we appreciate the money y'all gave us. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. As you can tell, as you hear from each of these communities, you'll see how busy, really busy they are and the great work that they do. So next will be Bethel. <laughs> and I'm sorry I got that wrong to start with. Okay. This is the Bethel Rural Development Organization. Yeah, my name is Carol Jones, president of the Bethel Rural, and uh, appreciate the invitation to come and talk to you. We've uh, had a pretty good year. And most of our work that we do with... Uh, uh, our organization is done through committees, and I'm going to give out a report that's broken down into the different committees. So just bear with me, and we'll get through this fairly quickly. We have a benevolence committee, and within this committee, we have partnered with Duke Power, Haywood EMC, uh, to pay electric bills for seven families. Uh, we've made monetary donations to the Bethel Elementary and Middle Schools for the Christmas fund for needy children, as well as food for the needy children during Christmas and during spring breaks. And we've also made donations for the Bethel Middle School track lighting, and we've made several other significant monetary donations to the Haywood County Sheriff's Department for the Cops for Kids program, Center Pigeon and Lake Logan Fire Departments, and the By Haywood Agritourism Haywood Waterways Preservation, North Carolina. And we have an education committee. And this committee has funded a $1,000 scholarship to a Pisgah High School graduate this year, awarded three STEM awards to Bethel Elementary students, and gave out a citizenship award to another Bethel Middle School student. And of all things, we presented a program on Bethel's history to the Bethel Middle School students. I think we enjoyed, and I know we enjoyed doing that more than they enjoyed the presentation, <laughs> but I could tell some of them were zoned out and not real appreciative. And we have also have a food pantry, meets once every uh, month, and we provide boxes and boxes of food for families in Bethel. So far this year, we've served 175 families and our expenditure has been around $1,700. <clears throat> and we also gave out to these pantry customers coupons for fresh produce from our local farms. And this was done through the, through the support of the Farm Bureau and three local churches. I think most everybody's heard of that Bethel 5K half marathon race. It's the oldest half marathon in the state that we sponsor, and it's our largest fundraiser. We uh, connect with dozens of sponsors who sponsor that race and support our mission, and this year we raised around $10,000 for our organization just through that race. Uh, and we, have, uh, we had about 75 volunteers who came out and uh, put on that race for us, including the Sheriff's Department's deputies who helped guide uh, the traffic and keep things safe. Uh, Historic Preservation Committee is one of our more active committees. We've done several things over the, the year. I'm gonna mention just a couple. One was uh, we got one of the Bethel's local uh, bridges, Trust Bridge Number 79, recognized and listed on the National Register of Historic Places. This bridge was built in 1891, has several unique considerations uh, was why it uh, got on the register. But most importantly, this is the oldest metal truss bridge in North Carolina. I also presented uh, our annual Pigeon Valley Award to Cheryl Inman Haney for the books that she has written and for her relentless work in uh, helping get two highway historical markers located up in Bethel. One of our more successful things that we've done is the release of a DVD last year, very successful DVD, 
And I wanted to, I want to ask Evelyn Coltman, who was a primary producer, organizer, and pusher of that project, to tell us a little bit about that DVD. Hi, I'm Evelyn Coltman, and I'm chair of the Historic Preservation Committee, and thank you for allowing us to come today. Uh, I'm going to touch on just a couple of other things besides the Sunburst DVD. Uh, since 2005, our historic and rural preservation committees have produced six books, five DVDs, two CDs. We've collected two historic art prints, erected five local historic uh, site markers, and we have two sites that we are responsible for getting on the National Register, the Trust Bridge and Francis Mill. Uh, rural Preservation's Fertile Fields of Bethel, DVD was developed as a classroom teaching tool and has been distributed to the 100 counties in North Carolina. Our sunburst and other logging operations in the Bethel and Coal Mountain region DVD, my daughter said, boy, could you not think of a shorter title than that, but it's actually what it is. So um, it was released right at the end of uh, 2018, and it was massively popular, so popular that I could hardly get my own Christmas done. I was running back and forth, uh, taking it to the bookstores and to people. And we just re learned recently that um, it won the North Carolina Society of Historians Multimedia Award, and this is our third state history award for our DVDs. And um, <clears throat> The Sunburst uh, DVD revisits the early 20th century logging operation on the West Fork of the Pigeon River that resulted in the construction of Champion Paper and Fiber, now Evergreen Packaging. Sunburst was one of the largest and most significant logging operations in uh, the region. We collected the st uh, stories of 20 speakers over a five-year span, that's how long it took us to record it, who knew the sunburst and other logging operations narratives. The DVD expands its reach to the East Fork logging operation um, on Coal Mountain. So we had, in Bethel, we had logging on the West Fork and on the East Fork. And um, that endeavor resulted in the Coal Mountain one in 100 years of lumbering uh, business in Haywood County by the Powell family. We also recorded the stories of two modern-day wood products industries that are still thriving in Bethel. To date, ours is the most comprehensive reporting about the history of logging and lumbering ventures in Bethel. And we want to thank you today for allowing us to uh, speak, and we thank you for your recent contributions and your continuing backing of the community organizations. Thank you. Just a little bit more. Uh, our Rural Preservation Committee partnered with the By Haywood to promote Haywood County farms, uh, produce stands, farmers markets, etc. Also, the, this Preservation Committee partnered with HEMC, Haywood County Farm Bureau, and the Food Coupon and FFA projects. Our committee chair, who is here, Carol Litchfield, is overseeing the Monarch Way Station Garden at uh, the Shelton House and is assisting other groups with establishing their own Monarch Way Stations. And uh, this committee this committee also sponsored a region-wide hemlock restoration workshop that was attended at Lake Logan. So if you have uh, uh, pests that are killing your hemlocks on your property, just see one of us. I think I would see Carol Litchfield. She can help guide you in the tell you how you might be able to get rid of the woolly aldigids who are killing our hemlocks. And we have one other committee. It's a beautification committee. It's a very small committee, but they do a lot of work. I'm not going to go through some, uh, most of the things that they do, but one big thing they have done uh, in the past year or two is to replace all the windows and shades in that uh, 1964 addition to our old Pre Bethel Presbyterian Church that also serves as our community center. Uh, and then a couple of things that are organizational that uh, are worthy of mentioning. Uh, we conducted another successful yard sale this year, participated in, in the Shelton House's Blue Ridge Heritage Weekend, 
And it's already been said that uh, we won the Community of Distinction Award from the Western North Carolina Community Organizations, which we're very proud of. And I think that's the eighth time in a row that we have won that. I would like to congratulate Fines Creek and Pigeon uh, Community Organizations for winning too. And uh, I think we made a real good showing uh, Haywood County did out of those 65 different organizations that were represented at Asheville. I think that's all. I, I am uh, the president. I'm going out president. Mike McLean, who, who is here, I think most of you know him, will be the president for the next two years. So just please continue to give him your support. And I know Mike will be successful as he is with most of these things that he gets into around here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, f I forgot, uh, how many uh, is here from Beaver Dam tonight? Just, just you <laughs> from Beaver Dam. Oh no, I mean, I mean, I was wanting everybody to stand. It was with. Okay, so you, so Beaver Dam. That's who's. And then okay, thank you. And then Bethel. That's, these are the folks from Bethel here tonight. I just wanted to recognize y'all. Okay, thank you. And then Crusoe's next. How many of y'all got from Crusoe tonight? Is it Crusoe? Okay. All right. There you go. Okay. It's a long way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. It's, you got to drive home in the dark, too. We appreciate yes, you coming. It's a curvy road. Thank you for coming. We do it all the time. Yeah, okay. Hi. Okay, I'm Ann Crawford from the Crusoe community. Uh, we're located in the old Crusoe School, which is pretty much the center of our community. We house a library, a thrift shop, a food pantry, a large auditorium, a full kitchen, and a walking track. Um, the County Convenience Center is also on the community property. We've had weddings and bridal and baby showers, birthday parties, graduation celebrations, and family reunions and fundraisers. We truly, everyone comes because we're right in the middle of the community. Um, our food pantry is an emergency pantry supported entirely by the people of our community. Uh, Laurel Bank Campgrounds, Riverside Campgrounds, and Springdale um, Golf Course keep us filled with shelf-stable food items, uh, soaps, <coughs> toothpaste, toothbrushes, laundry detergents, and they also give us monetary donations to help buy fresh foods when people need them and to re replace items that are used and that they're not here during the winter months. Um, one thing about our food pantry is that it is an emergency pantry. Um, we don't do it weekly. We're more there for families, even to working people, and maybe they've had a car breakdown, and they've spent $1,000 to get a car repaired. They're running short. All they have to do is call us. Um, I don't ask any questions. I don't have to know what you make, what your financial records are, because it's entirely given by the community, I can do that. And that's a big plus for us. Um, our library is run by a wonderful volunteer, and she's personally bought new books. She bought graduated readers for us this year for the kids in our community. Um, and we partnered with the Crusoe Methodist Church this year to have a reading program for school-aged children in the community to keep up their reading skills throughout the summer. And with the graduated readers, as we read to them, they could turn around and read to us in books that they could take care of. Our thrift shop helps us with our day-to-day -day operating expenses and is run by volunteers. We've done a day of caring for the last two years, and that's a day that we give any school-aged child in need a pair of new shoes, new socks, new undergarments, toothpaste, toothbrushes, shampoos, deodorant, and several outfits from our thrift shop. We do this in partnership with East Fork Baptist Church, the Living Church of Jesus Christ, and in several other churches in the area. Our fundraisers supported two $1,000 scholarships for local high school seniors. We had our 30th annual quilt show this year and have been on the Haywood County Quilt Trail with our Moon Over Cold Mountain Four Seasons Square since 2013. That's a great draw for tourists in this area. <coughs> Once a month, there's a circle play. It's a group of local musicians who come out and play, enjoy each other's talents, for, and for the community at large to come out and enjoy some live music. They're really good. 
and, and everybody really seems to enjoy that. We offer free Wi-Fi. We have a computer that's there for the community to use. Um, we participate in the veterans' flags. So you've seen the crosses and the flags all in the areas. We put those up twice a year. Um, they're really awesome to see, and, and the community thoroughly enjoys to come out. Lots of pictures taken. Um, we had a Halloween party for the kids in the community. That's our last hoorah of the year. We do not have heat in our building, so the water has been turned off and the lines have been blown out. So we do keep our pantry open, and if anyone is in need, they just have to call. We can still go down and do that, but we don't do an every day. We have no water, no heat. So, um, And when I'm saying we and our, I'm speaking for our entire community. Whether you were born there, you moved there, you're a summer resident, Nothing can be done without the help of everyone. We are truly blessed to be in such a wonderful community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and our next community will be Fines Creek. And who else is from Fines Creek? Please stand. <laughs> okay, great. You've got a good representation, too. <laughs> okay, Karen, welcome. Good evening. I'm Karen Hammett. I'm from the Fines Creek community, and we have our community center in the old Fines Creek School, which comprises four buildings, which is a challenge to keep going. Uh, I'm going to focus on the four major activities that the Fines Creek Community Association does, and that is the Mana Food Pantry, scholarships, a business incubator, and socialization or gathering space. Our Mana Food Pantry has been in existence since 2007 and currently serves an average of about 50 families a month. Our Mana Pantry is able to provide TFAP, which is the income-based food assistance program. We are also able to provide SNAP, which is now SAM, but I don't know what that acronym is, to our clients <coughs> as well as fresh produce from Mana and the Haywood Gleaners. The food and household supplies are given on the fourth Wednesday of each month, except when it runs into a holiday like Christmas. At that time of the food giveaway, a member of the Senior Resource Center is also there to assist and explain about the programs of the Senior Resource Center, and that person has been very busy with the SHIP program right now. Scholarships. We have offered a local high school senior a scholarship for continuing education since the inception of the community club in 1996. Since that time, we've offered 46 scholarships to graduating seniors. We currently have one student attending Western Carolina at this time. In addition, the community clubs in Haywood County must endorse their local students who apply for the Journey Scholarship through Western Carolina communities. And the Journey Scholarship is av available to the students in the 17 Western counties. Haywood County has three of those 10 Journey Scholarships this freshman year. So that says a lot for Haywood County. As a business incubator, Fines Creek, with its four buildings, that has all this space, and we want to share it with our community. With the commissioner's <coughs> permission, we currently have four small businesses, Ledford Produce, Smoky Mountain Artisan Crafts, Steve's Craft Supply, and the Better Bean Coffee Cafe housed on our site. We have another business that is interested in using the old cannery, but that's in the exploration stage, and we have not moved very far on that one. As a gathering space, the building serves many purposes. Foremost is to house the Fines Creek branch of the Haywood County Library System. We love this library, especially before it snows, because we can go down and get our DVDs and our books before we get snowed in. The library Wi-Fi is used at all times. I can come back late at night, and somebody will be in that parking lot with their laptop 
either checking emails, ordering supplies, doing homework, and without easy access to broadband in Fines Creek, that library Wi-Fi is used all the time. And it serves more people than are actually counted in the library's attendance when it's open. Those buildings house community benefits, holiday celebrations, dances, community meals, reception, games, church revivals, we've had a haunted house this year, bingo, craft events, yard sales, music events, and probably a few termites. <laughs> I'd like to tell you a little bit about the grants that Fines Creek has applied for this year and has received. The fund for Haywood County from the Community Foundation of Western North Carolina gave us funds to upgrade our kitchen, and we just had an article just just Friday in the, in the Mountaineer about our kitchen and our new stove and our dividing wall, which is going to help us keep down the heat of trying to keep the pipes from freezing. We've just finished the requirements for that grant. We have a 1% TDA partnership through the town of Clyde. Fines Creek wrote the grant for a quilt square for the Fines Creek Methodist Church. And this would enable the Haywood County Quilt Trail to have a north entrance off exit 15 on Interstate 40. You can travel down the Fines Creek Road and down Highway 209 to begin the quilt trail. And the quilt trail, the quilt square has been delivered to Fines Creek Methodist Church, and they're now in the process of trying to figure out how they're going to mount it without mounting it on the building of that old church. The Community Foundation of Western North Carolina People in Need grant supplied funds to help us operate our manna pantry this year. And this grant allowed for the purchase of food, electricity, propane, and other supports needed to be able to keep that manna food pantry operating. Grace Episcopal, Episcopal Church provided funds to begin construction of a handicapped ramp on the brick building west side that will allow folks to get into that building without necessarily having to always climb stairs. Food Lion Grant of, of 84 boxes of packaged meals and two pallets of food for the Mana Pantry came in two months ago and we've got that and have started providing that food to those recipients of our food distribution. And just in, which is just recent, the North Carolina Community Foundation, the Haywood County Unrestricted Endowment, gave us funds to install handicapped stalls in our women's restroom behind the library. The men will get one eventually, but we'll have to write another grant for that. And the commissioners have given us some funds which we have already started spending. We have used it for supplies to cover the serving window in the, uh, between the cafeteria, the dining hall, and the kitchen so we can finish blocking off all the air exchange there so our heat goes down. And we purchased a heater to go in the back hall to keep the restroom pipes from freezing behind the library. So thank you, gentlemen, for your support. We appreciate it. Thank you, Karen. Our next organization will be the North Hominy Community Club. Do we have anybody here with you tonight? <coughs> okay. Oh, we're glad you're here. <laughs> and as he's coming up, I just wanted to say uh, North Hominy lost a couple of really good uh, uh, community members uh, from their club, uh, Geneva Worley and, and Bud Liner. I just yeah. wanted to give a shout out. And, and I know that uh, that's, they were really good hard workers, and uh, we're going to miss them. I miss seeing them. I miss seeing them this year, so but, uh, but go ahead. Thank you. Okay, I'm George Thomas. I'm the Vice President of North Harmony Community Center. We're located out on Newfound. Uh, let's see, our uh, uh, most activities our community center revolve around the Mana Food Bank, which is our week. We give away food, produce, and vegetable stuff weekly, and we have boxes monthly. 
third Sunday. In January <laughs> through October, we had, uh, for the bread and produce, 987 families. Let's see. My trifocals get unfocused. Uh, January through October, for our man, man of food boxes, we had 331 families. And we've got it broke down into individuals. But with our Apple Festival, we just concluded it. And we made uh, 660 pints of apple butter, 108 and a half pints of apple jelly, and 1,723 fried pies. And I've got about five cases of apple butter left and maybe 35 fried pies. So if you want them, just call me and I'll meet you at the community center. I expect to sell that this week. Uh, the Gideons use our facility once a month, free of charge. Uh, it's also rented for family reunions, receptions, birthdays, yard sales, showers, concealed carry classes, just whatever they want, we, we rent it out. We have a recently renovated kitchen and dining area, new floor and fresh paint, new countertops and sink, and LED lighting installed. We're in the process of putting security cameras on the outside right now and overnight lights because we've got a few wild childs in the neighborhood like to hang out there. Uh, and we're all always grateful for your support. Appreciate everything you do. Thank you. You too. Okay, our next community uh, to present is the Pigeon Community Multicultural Development Center. And how many folks have you got here tonight? <laughs> okay, a couple of you. Okay, great. <laughs> and I told them at the last meeting, I, I was working on a house near that, their building, and I went by there all the time. There's, there is a lot of activity going on at the building, so. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. I want to start first by saying thanks for allowing us the space to come and chat you up for a few minutes, and of course, for the support that you showed us monetarily at our meeting last month. This year, the Pigeon Community Center has had a great fun year. Um, it's <laughs> It started in January. We had a small fire that completely devastated our kitchen, um, which was followed in February by a nice, fun bit of vandalism um, that destroyed our kitchen and damaged a whole lot of food. But in spite of that, we had 260 volunteers to come and help us get the building back together, which resulted in 11,385 volunteer hours. So we have had a lot, a lot of activity going on this year. We're located at 450 Pigeon Street, which means we're actually the only community center in the county that's inside city limits, which is something that we think is really kind of fun and we take a lot of pride in. Um, our largest programs are our summer enrichment programs and our after school programs. Our summer enrichment program is for Haywood County students. Um, it is a nine week program that runs Monday through Friday, eight to five, as soon as school is over. We provide um, two meals a day and a snack, which if you know about kids, that's the best part of it. Our county definitely has food insecurity, so to be able to provide those meals for our kids every year is something that we are very, very fortunate to be able to do. We have anywhere between 50 to 70 kids a year. Um, we have volunteers that come in three times a week and read one-on-one -on -one because the purpose of the program, while also providing safe space for the children, is to help improve or continue to grow their skills during their summer months off so they don't go back to school and forget everything that they learned the year before. Um, we also take field trips. 55 kids in a building for eight weeks is a little bit hectic, so once a week we get out in the community and we go places. We go to the pool, we go to Atlanta, we've been to the Human and Civil Rights Museum, we've been to the MLK Museum, we go to farms in the county and play. We go to Cherokee, excuse me, play in the river, play with the rangers. We get them out to experience things that they might not be able to otherwise. Um, our program is geared towards low-income families. However, we accept all families in Haywood County. Our other large 
um, youth program is our after school program, which runs September to May, Monday through Friday. Again, we provide a meal because not every child in our county has access to dinner. So we provide a hot meal at the end of the day. We also do one-on-one -on -one tutoring. They read every day and have their homework finished so that when their parents pick them up, they're able to focus on a little bit of family time instead of having to fight homework and then fight supper to get into bed. So it's just a service that allows our families a little more time together. Um, we also have senior dinners, which we have not been able to hold this year because of the state of our kitchen, which is finally back to 150% with the help of insurance, grants, tons and tons and tons of volunteers, and mm -hmm. this county. We absolutely could not have had our summer program, could not have been back in our building as quickly as we were, could not have done the things that we did this year without the people of this county. Um, our, our, our organization is funded by churches, by local donations. We, like every other community, apply for grants, but they're hard, it's hard. So we make up the space in fundraisers, our events and programs. We offer, um, offer a little bit of income. We also rent out the bidding, but this year we have no, no place to do that. So we're excited for our new year coming up. We are also an emergency manna food pantry, which we have been able to continue actually, even though we've had all these challenges this year. We also all collect the stories of African Americans in Haywood County and have produced a book. The first volume is Lift Every Voice and we're waiting on the second printing of that book and continuing to collect stories for the next volume. Um, we at the Community Awards received um, the Calico Cat, which is for building improvement and it kind of went for our lemony snicket year. Um, but like I said, that's really not our award at all. It's a community award that we would not have received if the folks hadn't stepped up and donated and showed up and cleaned and scrubbed. So we are super, super, super appreciative of the community. And it just goes again to show how well we as a county work together. Um, I'm, I'm sure that Everybody was busy, and people didn't have to show up, but other communities stopped what they were doing and said, hey, what do you guys need? Because that's just kind of the county that we live in, and it's something that we are excited that has been fostered here, and it is actually not without you guys that th things like that continue to grow. So um, in celebration this year, we're asking everybody to come to our season of lights, which is December the 7th from five to eight, which is a multicultural holiday celebration, tons and tons and tons of food that's coming out of the brand new kitchen. So that should be a great time. And thanks, thanks so much. Okay, and then finally we have uh, with our Haywood Community <coughs> Development Council. <laughs> You're the guy that ties it all together, right? <laughs> I'm Greg Livengood. I'm the current president of the Haywood County Community Development Council. Um, we serve to support, advise, and foster all of the county community associations. Uh, we, along with the Western Carolina Communities, WNC Communities, also help other communities to form their own community associations if they desire to. Um, there are six community development clubs. We know what they are. Everybody said what it is. Um, and everybody's talked about the awards that we won. And uh, that all deals with how important they are to our community. These, these clubs all have mana pantries. They all feed people in this community. Imagine going to bed at night not being able to feed your children. One of the most important things these people do is feed unfortunate people in this county. Um, we, what, one of the things we do, uh, the Community Associations Development Council, we hold quarterly meetings, we gather, we have dinner, 
We discuss what we've done for the month, what we plan to do for the um, coming month, and um, we share new ideas and best methods between the organizations and the cross-pollination of the ideas um, and the support of each other's clubs is one of the most important things that the Community um, Development Council does. It's, uh, they, we eat volunteers. They, we go through volunteers <coughs> like a big dog. Um, I was, I'd had down that, that a minimum of 15,000 hours of volunteer hours for the clubs, and listening to the clubs, it's substantially over 20,000 hours that are provided for the community. Feeding people, keeping the highways cleaner, providing a place for meetings. It's, it's a staggering amount of work that goes into it. And it's all done by volunteers. And um, we thank you for your financial support. And we, we appreciate y'all taking time out of your schedule to come and, you know, let us know. But this is broadcast in the county. So I guess anyone can volunteer. You don't have to necessarily live in the community. If you do, that's great. If you don't, maybe you have a loved one that lives there or something, I guess. I know, uh, I know some folks that volunteer maybe live in town and they can go and volunteer at whatever organization they would like to go to because I know everybody's looking for volunteers and that is really hard to do. So hopefully this will get the word out on the good work that y'all are doing because it's, it's really remarkable when you hear all that's been done and know that there's been thousands and ten thousands of hours spent doing that. And um, one thing I was thinking about was when you were talking about the DVDs, uh, maybe we could put those on the government channel, some of those, you know, and get the word out. I mean, I don't know if you've done that or not, but I mean, we have a government channel where this meeting is broadcast, and if you've got some, you know, DVDs, I'm sure that that would be part of what we maybe could do. So think, think about that. And does anybody here want to say anything? Well, I, I would just like to say I, I, I really appreciate everything that you all do. I mean, the, uh, every time I've been to one of your programs, the, the fact that, of what you do for the needy is, is always impressive. And, and something I was thinking about tonight is that, you know, as I scroll through my phone and I watch the television each night and I see the trash and the bad news and, and the backbiting that goes on, um, you know, hearing hearing the community clubs talk and you folks talk about what you do for people at least provides hope. And it may just be in this room right here that we get to experience this hope that there is good in this country uh, and there's good in this community, but this is. And, and, and it makes me feel good about where I live and, and very proud of the people who live here. And I just want to thank you so much for, for all that you do. Just same, the same message as Kurt just said, that uh, it amazes me and shocks me when we go to these community events and you hear each community get up and give reports on what they've done for the past year. You know, I've been doing it now for uh, going on four years. This is my third year. And uh, it's very impressive what these communities do. And as Kurt said, I'm very thankful for where I live uh, in Haywood County for this community and what each community does for their own community and each other. As was mentioned earlier, you know, it's not just in the communities, but they reach out to one another. So uh, thank you for what you do and keep up the good work. Well, I can just comment on, on the uh, cooking ability of these community clubs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Pigeon Community Center was over to fire two years ago and then uh, Crusoe hosted the county get-together the other night, and my wife and I was invited down to Fines Creek back in the summer and missed the elk uh, meeting over in, in uh, Cherokee. But I, I told my wife, I said, hey, they invited me to come down. I'm going down to eat fish. <laughs> and uh, so y'all got a great – look at the smiles on those faces. You know, as commissioners, we get a lot of bad news. We, we have some disgruntled people. and uh, But, you know, this is one of those good meetings, you know, where we get a good feedback from our community uh, clubs that uh, have a heart for the community and have a heart for the people. And we really appreciate you guys. Uh, it's a breath of fresh air. Still get you an apple pie. And y'all have – And, like, and like, George's okay. breakfast. I didn't want to miss George's breakfast. They have a great breakfast up there. We, we went up to that too. So that country ham really set me off the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs>
got to have plenty of water if you go to one of George's breakfast. <laughs> and as Bryant had alluded, uh, our community clubs, there were 65, I believe I heard you all say. So there's 65 clubs in Western North Carolina, and we have three here that I guess won the top three awards from Haywood County probably, or, or, uh, and so that's a pretty good showing for six community clubs and, and out of 65. And, and out of those, we won three awards, and I think that just shows that great, good things are going on in Haywood County. So thank you all for all your work. And if y'all need to slip out, that's okay if you don't want to stay for a whole meeting because I know, <laughs> I know you, it's getting dark. So <laughs> yeah. I'll, give, I'll give them just a minute. Yeah, thank you. I'll give them just a second to slip out. And uh, we're, uh, the, the next item on the, the community agency reports, we're going to hear an update from the sheriff. And, I, uh, you know, we, we, we hear a lot of bad things about uh, some, some of the work in our community, and I wanted the sheriff to come and let us know what's going on at the detention center because there's another, there's a, there's a reason that we have pathways and there's a reason that we have uh, that organization out there doing what they need to do. And I was wanting the sheriff to come and give his stats on what, the, what happens and why that was put into place. And, I didn't want to preface it, Sheriff, if you don't mind. A few years ago, we had met with you and I think a prison ministry and then the open door, and we had put together maybe trying to do something for uh, at the old prison that we had been given. And we had been given that old prison from the state because uh, Phil Hare had called Kirk Kirkpatrick and said, uh, we, uh, the minimum security prisons has been closed and the state was given one to the Cleveland County, I believe, or the community college in Cleveland County, and they and Phil Hare asked uh, Commissioner Kirk Patrick if he could, if if we would like to have the one in Haywood. And we, of course, we said yes because it's right next to our law enforcement center. So once we got those those uh, pr those prison cells, we thought, well, we could use that as part of the jail. And then we found out we couldn't use them as part of the, or part of the jail because a prison cell and a jail cell has got different <coughs> regulations, believe it or not. So we had to. Uh, so we needed to, then we had met with the homeless problem that we were having. And there are truly people, I know the bad apples is what we want to, is what we hear about and we want to focus on, but we don't realize how many hundreds of people have been helped, families that have been helped just to get them through uh, this, a little short time of, of homelessness. And then that ties together to what the sheriff is going to talk about tonight. So. And we're going to talk about faith-based programs. I'm a big proponent of faith-based programs because they work, and they're, they're, uh, they work very well. And the sheriff's going to give us some examples tonight. And I really appreciate, Sheriff, your vision and your, uh, your heart to, to try to reach out and to help folks who, you know, we, we're all not perfect, and sometimes we need a second chance. Sometimes we need third and fourth chances. And, um, and I'm glad that, uh, that we have, are giving people a little bit of grace to try to to try to get to that and get their lives back together. So, so go ahead. I, I wanted to say all that because a lot of the commissioners may be new and they didn't know how this kind of come about. I think we started on it in 2013. Yes. And the communities have done this in the church, mm -hmm. just like the community clubs that we heard from tonight. The community and the churches have gotten together and done this, and it saved taxpayers <coughs> thousands and thousands, if not million dollars by you know, taking this on and uh, really doing faith-based programs and you, you being open to do it. And, and I appreciate it as a commissioner. I really do appreciate it. So I'll, I'll let you go on. Sorry, I didn't mean to go on and That's on. That's all right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, good evening. Uh, what I wanted to do tonight, uh, real quickly, is to give you an overview from what we saw back in March of 2013 all the way up until uh, November uh, 8th, actually, of this year. And so, as you can see, in our jail population, in 2013, we was averaging 109 inmates. And today, in November, uh, as of the 8th of November, we had 112 inmates in our facility. The, the count for the males, as you can see, is just about uh, as it was in 2013. But... If you look at your female count, and I'm going to talk more about this uh, in just a few minutes, but that is a 25% increase. And that is not only becoming a problem here in Haywood County, 
but it's becoming a problem throughout the state of North Carolina as well. One of the other things that we see these days that we didn't even talk about in 2013, and that is a backlog of people who are sentenced and are ready to go to the Department of Corrections. The only problem is there is no place for them at the Department of Corrections. So guess who gets to hold on to these people that get sentenced by our court system? It's, your, it, it's you and I. We have to hold on to these uh, inmates until that DAC calls us and tells us to bring inmates or they send a bus to pick them up. So that is something like, uh, as of today, I had 12. So we have 12 inmates that are sitting there that is actually part of this population of 112. So that means that if you take the, this backlog away, we're actually nine below the average in 2013. But because we're having to hold on to them, then uh, that's just part of the, the, the issue that we have to deal with today that 2013 was not an issue. This right here is, uh, uh, let, me, let me go back, let's see. Let, let, me, let me hit this uh, slide first. This actually tells you that our jail population to include our main facility as well as our annex, uh, we have a capacity for 149 inmates. 109 in our main facility and 40 in the annex jail. I'll talk more about the annex jail in a little while and why that that number is really skewed. What we did in uh, the first of this month, we actually reached out to 12 other sheriff's offices because I wanted to see from them what their situation was as far as housing. Because I get a phone call, either myself or the chief deputy, uh, just about every day from another sheriff or a detention uh, center somewhere asking if we have room to keep inmates for, a, uh, for another county. And so in reaching out to these 12, we found out that of these 12 detention centers, they are housed, three of them are housing more females than what their capacity allows. And unfortunately, we, as of yesterday, our capacity is 31 females and we had 30. So we are right teetering on that same line as some of these other uh, detention centers are. Also, detention centers housing inmates and in other facilities out of these 12 that we checked, 11 of these are having to send inmates to other facilities, which is costing the county per inmate. Sometimes it would probably be uh, $60 a day and sometimes up to $120 a day. So uh, that is something that, that you are not, and the taxpayers in this county is not burdened with right now, and that is having to send inmates to other counties to be housed. What are we doing at the Haywood County Sheriff's Office and Detention Center? It all began with our jail ministry, and uh, I will stand very firmly on that for as long as I'm the sheriff and many years thereafter that I believe with all my heart that, this, that the crux of what we have done with jail ministry is one of the reasons and the main reason that our numbers continue to look like they do today as opposed to so many other counties throughout Western North Carolina. Uh, our detention center programming, and I'll talk more about that on another slide in just a few minutes, uh, but our, our inmates' days are filled with programming. And then, of course, the Pathway Center. The Pathway Center I'll talk about here in just a few minutes and, and show you a couple of slides that, uh, uh, that will tell you what is going on there as well. In talking about our jail ministry, we have trained over 600 volunteers from right here in this county uh, throughout that uh, have an opportunity to come in and, uh, and help our inmates uh, by giving them faith-based teaching, counseling, whatever the case may be. We operate that seven days a week, sometimes as many as three times a day. People have an opportunity to get ministry of some kind. 
uh, our churches are phenomenal. Uh, we, we have about 60 churches that work with us that we uh, see uh, week in and week out that we, uh, that we have uh, a, real rela a, a real relationship with, and uh, they do a fantastic job in helping us with our inmates, not only while they are inmates, but actually once that they get out and they begin this process of, of trying to get better. Uh, our churches, uh, that last bullet point says, many churches <laughs> offer support after incarceration by walking the former inmate into employment opportunities and housing while maintaining a high level of accountability for that person. Everybody that is in addiction or has been in addiction of some kind needs accountability, no matter what the addiction is. And this is one of the things that a lot of our churches are doing for us, is once that this individual leaves our jail, then they are helping them with housing, they're helping them with job opportunities, they are, they are doing a, a lot to be able to include this person and try to plug them into the community, and then they're holding these people accountable and responsible for what they do. There again, a big shout out to our churches in, in this county. Uh, the, the programs that, uh, that go on every day in our jail, we have, of course, our faith-based programs. We have Alcoholics Anonymous. We have Narcotics Anonymous. We have Life Works that comes in and teaches uh, ladies different kind of skills. You know, uh, th there are, there are uh, children now that's not taught what we was uh, whenever that we was growing up. Uh, and uh, so sometimes it has to be very, very basic with these, uh, with their, with our uh, inmates. But that's something that they do for us. We have the overdose prevention group uh, that comes in 20 hours a week from the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. And I know that they're coming back in a couple of weeks to talk to you about some more things that they're doing in the county. Uh, we have our HIV and hepatitis C testing, and then when uh, we are have just been awarded a grant, uh, a state grant through VI to start a medically assisted treatment program. What we're doing right now is we are looking at other programs throughout not only North Carolina but throughout the nation where that uh, sheriffs and sheriff's offices are working uh, these uh, MAT programs. And then, of course, the Pathway Center. Uh, about 18 months ago, there was two peer support specialists that was uh, embedded into our sheriff's office detention center and in with the inmates. And what they have done is they've saved our county about $80,000 by us having somebody there to be able to walk these people through. And what they do is they actually assist the jail ministry teams. They plug people into rehabilitation. They plug people into jobs, and, and they uh, uh, they file insurances for them. They do different things in order to get inmates ready to leave our facility and step back out into the real world. Um, and uh, they these two people do a fantastic job. They're there at eight o'clock in the morning. They don't leave at five o'clock in the afternoon. A lot of times they go over to the Pathway Center and work throughout the night. They're back on Saturdays and Sundays so many times. It's amazing what these two people have done. And uh, the, the second bullet is just the ability to offer hope, support, guidance, transitional housing and employment as people re-enter into, into our communities. Taking a look at these numbers, uh, 2017 women that went uh, to the pathways after jail and did not return to the pathways 20 out of 27. Men who take the chance and decide to go on the pathways out of the 62 that left our facility and walked over there and was plugged in and, and went through the program, 34 of the, of the 62 did not return and has not returned our facility. 2018, the women 29 and 18, and the men 60 and 29. That, that's, uh, that's about 52% for between both years for the men and over 60% for the women. It, uh, 
and in in my way of thinking that's huge whenever that I talk with other people whenever I talk with other sheriffs that don't have these programs um, they certainly wish that they had a county and they had communities and they had county commissioners and and others that that believed in people getting better by working with them and doing things for them which is uh, which is what we're trying to do this last slide right here talks about our lack of female housing what happens is we we have four pods up in our main jail our largest pod is where we put our females we have 31 bunks in that pod if our female inmates keep increasing we're going to have to do something like everybody else is that's the one thing that we are going to have to take a look at simply because we just do do not have the ability to be able to put these females down at the annex I'll, and I'll talk to you more about the annex on uh, on the right side of that slide but uh, that is a an issue for us that's going to be a problem as we see more and more females come to the jail now let's talk about the the annex just a minute the, the annex was built many years ago and it was built to just house weekend inmates people who were just coming for a very short period of time a lot of work release type things that we we really don't do a whole lot of today there's 40 beds in that annex the problem though is that this is not a I-3 institutionally rated general population for inmates to be housed. So the, the kind of people that we have to put down there are your, your sentenced inmates, your child support uh, guys, bonds, really, really low bonds, 5,000 or less, um, people who are at a very low risk to escape. Um, but our problem is that because of the way the building was built many years ago there you cannot lock the doors properly you have to depend on fencing you have to depend on other things because it's fire rated completely different than a regular detention center would be and so therefore we've had to spend quite a bit of money just to be able to get it to that point and uh, we are working on some things right now to to, uh, to try to shore that up. But if somebody wants to leave that facility, there's a, I'm just going to be honest with you, they can leave that facility, uh, even with detention officers there, because detention officers have to stay in, a, in another location than where the inmates are. It, uh, whenever the jail inspector comes up, he, uh, uh, we talk about this every time he comes. Um, so it is something that we're going to need to take a look at as time goes on. The annex has been good for what it has been for, but at the end of the day, we're going to have to we're going to have to take a look eventually at um, at maybe adding a pod at some point in time. It, it it has been it's been wonderful to see that our numbers have not increased no more than they have, and there again. Uh, I tell you, it's because of this county and these communities and the heart they have for ministry and rehabilitation that we've been able to keep this thing uh, uh, upright and, 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 the, and, and the, the, the train on the tracks. But I'm afraid that eventually we're going to have to get to the point that we have to sit down and talk about maybe uh, adding a pod at some point in time. One of the reasons we can't put the females down at the annex, uh, because that would be, that, that in my way of thinking would have been a logical uh, and an easy thing for us to do, but we, we cannot uh, divide these, these ladies up and separate them accordingly, because we have ladies that's charged with uh, very, very serious felonies to include murder, and we also have you know, ladies in there that's charged with trespassing. And because we have to keep them segregated away from each other, it just does not make for a very good, uh, good mix. So it's, it's something, like I said, we're going to have to look at eventually. But uh, 
that's uh, that's my presentation for the middle of the year. It won't be too long. I'll come back in probably February and give you a, a, a year brief from 2019 totally. Any questions? I have a few. Um, I was looking at the the ones who reoffend, and we all know that drug use is a huge problem. Um, some people you can't help till they're ready to be helped. Do you think that plays any role in the people that, the numbers that are reoffending, or do you think it's just they didn't change? Well, it, it does. You, you know, I have parents and uh, loved ones that come and sit in front of me in my office day in and day out, and they are begging me to help their child or their loved one that's back there. But until that, that person that's back there in that facility decides that they want to change, there's absolutely nothing that mom and dad, husband and wife, wh whoever it is that's sitting out there with me that we're going to be able to do to help them. You know, they have got to want in their heart to change. And hey, you've been in the medical field, you've worked mm -hmm. in it for as long as I have, Mark. You, you know how it is. Whenever somebody decides that they want help, then there's help out there for people. The problem is getting people's heart and their head right at the same time to accept that kind of help. You know, we, we send people uh, to rehabilitation very, very often. And unfortunately, sometimes they beat us back. And, and it's just that they're not ready to go. Their parents or their family's ready for them to go because they're, hey, they're, they're sick and tired of being sick and tired with them. But until that they get ready, it really makes it tough. Do you think that uh, with the women increasing, it has anything to do with the homeless population that is here? Or do you think it's just one of those trends that is changing? Well, we're seeing more and more women be arrested in general. So, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of times these ladies are... Um, are holding the men's uh, contraband. And uh, that's something else that we have to work on day in and day out. And that's the reason uh, we're very thankful for our female officers to be out there with us so that we can put our hand to those kind of problems right there on the spot. But what we're seeing is a lot of females being arrested for uh, drug charges. The uh I know one of the big things is uh, it's easy to blame uh, one particular society for things that go wrong, and that's not the right way to look at it. I think a lot of people's apprehension is because they don't really understand. The big elephant in the room is it's real easy to blame uh, those folks, and I just want to make sure that they're not the ones that are, are truly getting blamed unless they're the ones that are creating the problem. Um, I know it's, it's huge with ICE and people that are here from other nationalities, uh, it's become a political statement to not honor those detainers when they're sent in. Do you see that as being a problem for us or are we gonna, gonna honor those if ICE says we would like you to hold this person till we can get there? No, we're gonna honor our ICE okay. detainers. Yes. I kind of thought we would, but I know that's one of the hard things for- no, we're, uh, we're gonna follow the law. So that is the law. Yes, sir. It is. <laughs> okay. I got one, I got one more question. Um, I know you've got a task force that you had set up to try to keep people from slipping through the cracks. Like, I'm going to use Jackson County because it's an entirely separate area. You were able to communicate so that people didn't just get away with one thing here and go over there and do it. Uh, is that still going? And do you think that has something to do with, with these people that you're getting because they just can't get away with it anymore? I'd like to think that it is. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that it is. We we share a lot of information with all the with with all of our neighbors mm -hmm. in Western North Carolina, and uh, we're we're all part of a, of a uh, task force. And because of that, you know, drug dealers don't recognize city limit signs, county limit signs. They don't care about it. So we're in a situation where we pass along our information to Jackson County, Cherokee, Hendersonville, uh, Buncombe County, and they do the same thing for us. We're, we're, we're very fortunate to all work very closely together here in West North Carolina. 
Well, I think you do an awesome job, you and all of your officers and, and, and everyone really in Haywood County does a good job trying to keep us safe. I know you can't do everything, but we do appreciate everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have something good? Yeah, I, I would just like to add, I mean, the, the numbers are, are really good. I mean, some people would look at these numbers and say, well, it hadn't changed a whole lot. Well, they're not, you know, for one, you're not even considering the population growth that we've had in Haywood County the last six years. Uh, just the normal population growth. And then you're also, I mean, we're not considering the population growth of those people that have come to this area that cause, that have, are, have more potential to be in jail than not in jail. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's an issue that we're having to deal with, that you're having to deal with, that Waynesville's having to deal with as well. Uh, and, and given that, to have these numbers, I, I think it's great. Uh, that you've been able to do that, and it shows the effectiveness of those ministries because you're, you know, you're helping so many people, but you're also having to fight the fact that more people are here that you're having to deal with as well, and 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 that's something that that's obvious. If you've lived here for years, we know who those people are because we've lived with them. When we've grown up. You and I have grown up with them. Now those people are getting a little bit old, too old to do what they were doing before, but we know those faces, and then we and then you know that. Hey, those pe these people aren't the people that we're used to dealing with, uh, and how they're here or how they got here. I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't know about that. But that's something that you're just having to deal with. And, and that being said, I mean, you, I think things are going as good as they can. But I think it's inevitable that we're going to have to have a pod, another yeah. pod, uh, because of the because of the annex jail um and, and the lack of its its compliance and th them doing the best they can with it and because this population is going to grow i mean it's anticipated our population here in haywood county is going to grow and therefore when the entire population grows so does the population of offenders and so uh i think we need to be getting those numbers together now to prepare for that because and, and we've known about that since we built this jail Years ago, yeah, it was, we, built, to add on. It was yeah. built to add a pot on. We mm -hmm. see the population growth. We know the population growth's coming, and we know the issues that we have. And so, I mean, I, I'm assume you you have not just said that's what I'm asking for, but I assume that because of because of the numbers that you've presented, because of the anticipation that we need to start looking at that. Don't do you not think that that's something seriously that we need to be sure? Doing? Well. I'd Whenever I became sheriff in March of 13, we had mm -hmm. these conversations yep. that the jail was full and we was going to yeah. have to do something right then. And I think because of your, you being proactive and the things that y'all helped me with and the things that our community has helped us with, we've been able to, to wait nearly seven years. Mm -hmm. yeah. to, Taxpayers need to take note. To, to you, be, we've waited seven years to add this pod. Yeah. So you've had seven years of not having to add on because of these programs. Absolutely. Because they work. Absolutely. So, hey, we, we, we have, we've stretched it out seven yep. years, and, hey, we may be able to stretch it out a little bit more. But I just wanted you to see the numbers and see what other counties are having to do and the cost that, that you know, because you can, uh, it cost us about $80 a day to, to keep an inmate right now. And so, you know, it's just going to continue, unfortunately. And if you're getting, if, if people are sending prisoners to our prison, so you, I mean to our jail, we're getting paid for that, the county is. Yes. From the other counties. Yes, sir. Plus they're having to send two, like you said, two deputies or a deputy over here and the mileage and all that to get them here. Yes. And to go back and then pick them back up. So, you know, we're not having to do that. And a lot of those counties have added jails, have built new jails and have added jail space. Mm -hmm. And they're still busting at the seams because Absolutely. They haven't done what we did. <laughs> right. And exactly. So, and, and I wanted to also, did you, did you have a uh, The only thing I wanted to ask is that the prisoners that we keep on the, in the misdemeanor confinement program mm -hmm. and also the, the prisoners they just don't have room for, does the, does the state, once they've been sentenced to DOC and we, they can't be sent to DOC because DOC won't take it, and you say DAC, is it DOC? It, it, it's DAC. It used to be DOC, now it's... Department of, of Adult Correction, so okay. it's DAC now. All right. Um, that shows how long I've been involved in this. Uh, do they pay, does the state pay us anything for those? $40 a day. 40 so half of what it costs. So half we're, we're really paying what it $40 costs. when we could be paying zero if they were sent down. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's right, the law changed. 
Yeah. And, and I just wanted to get another give a shout out to the churches that have really stepped Absolutely. up. Amen. You know, they don't sit in the pews on Sunday. Probably they've been there before they got to church on Sunday. They've been to the jail. They have. And they've been there during the week, in the evenings, yeah. and, and talking to these folks. Because they have a, ten, they have a very, uh, they've got an audience there that doesn't really have anything to do. And, and, uh, and we know that if you can change their heart, you're going to change their actions. And that's what it's all about. That's right. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, we're, we're changing their hearts. And I, I want to give a shout out to the past commissioners, Mark Swanger, Michael Sorrells, and Bill Upton, because and Kirk. And I, because we, we did look at this in 2013, and we, we, we took that chance to do that, and it's really paid it's really paid big dividends. I had done a lot of research, and secular programs that are only effective 10 to 15 percent of the time, and you're saying that you're over 50 percent with the faith faith based programs. So uh, we know that they're working, and and I really just appreciate all that you've done. Uh, and and you know and, and how well it's worked. And I want to thank thank the, everyone that's, that works in that ministry with y'all. Thank you. Stuff. Y'all have anything? Okay. All right. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sheriff.